Mount Everest. I'm sure many of us are familiar with this image, or perhaps more recently a similar image with queues of people waiting to summit, literally risking life and limb to do so. The challenge of reaching the top of the world has lured mountaineers for 100 years. The first person to set foot on the mountain was George Mallory in 1921. In 1923, he was famously asked the question, why climb Everest? His immortal answer was incredibly simple. He said, because it's there. Eight years ago, my husband and I embarked on our own Everest adventure to trek to base camp. It's an incredible place, and after flying into possibly the most dramatic airport in the world, we embarked on our two-week trek, trekking from village to village and staying in small tea houses each night. Four days in, we had reached a small village called Dingboshi, which is about 4,500 metres above sea level. Now, altitude sickness is common. It affects more than three quarters of people who trek at altitude. And we were certainly no different. We felt the effects with nausea, headaches, tiredness. But my husband started to feel worse. He began to get very breathless, and every step was a mammoth effort. He had developed a condition called high altitude pulmonary oedema. This is a condition that affects less than 1% of people at altitude. And when it's not treated, it can be fatal. High altitude pulmonary edema doesn't discriminate based on your age, your fitness, your sex, or even how often you've climbed, how often you've climbed at altitude. There is absolutely nothing that we could do. We were four days from the nearest small airport. We had no medicine. We had no doctor. And light was falling. That meant that there was absolutely no possibility of a rescue helicopter being able to land. That was the worst night of my life. Watching my husband struggling to breathe not knowing if he was going to be able to make it through the night, and watching as he coughed up this pink, frothy liquid from his lungs. I kept thinking, this, this can't be happening. These things don't happen. He's young, and he's fit, and he's healthy. But these things can happen, and they do happen. Fortunately, after what seemed like an eternity, the sun began to rise, and that meant that the rescue helicopter could come. I will never forget the relief as I heard the distinctive sound of the rescue helicopter coming into land, and knowing that that was his lifeline. My husband was airlifted to Kathmandu, where there is an incredible hospital and doctors who specialize in dealing with emergencies coming off the mountain. After another agonizing wait, when they tried to pump much-needed oxygen back into his body, they came out to call me into the room. And they told me, they told both of us, that they'd managed to stabilize his oxygen levels. He was going to be fine. Realizing your mortality hits hard. Realizing the mortality of your loved ones hits even harder. And facing that mortality, is terrifying. Believe me, this was a life-changing moment for both of us, and it certainly put a lot of things into perspective. I actually have a PhD in the very phenomenon that nearly killed my husband. What are the chances? I had all this knowledge. I could picture exactly what was happening inside his lungs, and there was nothing that I could do to help. At the time, there was nothing that I could do to help, and that had to change. As a clinical research scientist, I have spent my life researching other people's health, working on new medicines to keep people healthy or to make them better. But what about my own family's health? 
I also strongly felt the responsibility to be safeguarding my own family's health. So the question is, is there a way to easily research our own health, to gather information, to share and use this information to our health's advantage? Now, as I said, high altitude pulmonary edema can affect anyone. It's also very difficult to spot, especially in the early stages. But there are some clinical signs, such as increased heart rate and decreased oxygen levels. If we had been using simple, um, simple devices, such as a heart rate monitor or an oxygen sensor, you know, the ones you clip onto your finger and they give you an instant reading, then perhaps we might have been able to spot these signs. And perhaps if we'd seen his heart rate start to go up and his oxygen levels start to go down, then we could have stayed at a lower altitude for longer so he had more time to acclimatise. Or we could have gone back down the mountain. If we had been tracking our health, there is a possibility that we would have been able to avoid a medical emergency. So we're all used to taking care of ourselves, right? We exercise, we eat healthily, and we wear sunscreen. But when we get sick, we're reactive. Why is that? And more importantly, how do we become more proactive when it comes to our health? Now, Rahul stole my question, so I already know that quite a few of you are already wearing fitness devices tonight. But how often do you actually use these devices to, for more than clocking your weekly run or feeling good about hitting 10,000 steps? The data in your fitness device can tell you so much more. Most fitness trackers these days will give you information on heart rate. A lot of them will also give you information on sleep patterns and metabolic rate. And these are indicators of your health. For example, your heart rate actually increases when you're ill. Now, this is a very subtle change, but if you know your normal range, then perhaps you can see when this happens. And if you can see when this happens, then that means you can take action. And it might be as simple as slowing down for a bit, taking a rest, hydrating, or maybe it's time to see the GP. Fun fact. Apple Watches now have an inbuilt ECG. So disclaimer, this is not intended to replace a traditional diagnosis or treatment. And at the moment, this functionality is only available in the US, in Europe, and Hong Kong. But it should be coming to Singapore soon. So what does this actually mean? Well, traditionally, if you wanted to have an ECG done, you would have to go to a clinic. A specialist would then have to attach six or 12 wires to you and wait for a printout of the electrical activity in your heart. That specialist would then have to review the printout before giving you your results. This can only now be done in a simple watch. But if fitness trackers really aren't your thing, there are other ways to research your health. There are smart scales. Gone are the days of watching the needle move on your mechanical scale. Now, your digital skill will not only tell you how much you weigh, but it will also tell you your bone mass, your muscle mass, how hydrated you are, and it will send this information to your phone. There are apps. Of course, there are apps. There are apps that will help you track your pregnancy, that mole on your skin, or make sure that you're eating a balanced diet. If you're asthmatic, there are smart inhalers that will tell you how well you are using them. And if you're a diabetic, there are now wearables that will continuously monitor your glucose levels over a 24-hour period. Today, there are 600,000 diabetics in Singapore. And the School of Public Health estimates that by 2050, half of all Singaporean adults will have developed diabetes before they're 70. So imagine for a moment that you're one of these 600,000. Traditionally, Diabetics have to take finger prick tests to test their glucose levels. So for a lot of diabetics, this means pricking their fingers multiple times a day, getting a small drop of blood, putting it on a cartridge, putting it in a reader, and getting a readout of their glucose levels. 
But how accurate is this, this small snapshot into your condition? Having a wearable that attaches to your arm means that you can now read that data at any point using an app on your mobile phone. This has a huge impact because not only do you understand your diabetes better and you understand when your glucose levels are fluctuating, maybe at 3 a.m. in the morning, when you certainly wouldn't be doing a finger prick test, but it means that you and your doctor can manage your diabetes more effectively. And by managing your diabetes more effectively now, you can reduce your risk of developing secondary conditions later in life. And if you multiply this by 600,000. So you see, data has a lot of power. Data has the power to save lives. Now, my husband isn't the sort of person who lets a near-death experience come between him and his dreams. And these days, I am not the sort of person who would let him go gallivanting off into the mountains with no way of tracking his health. Five years ago, he returned to Everest Base Camp to complete his challenge. And that's exactly what he did. But this time, he went armed with simple devices. He had a heart rate monitor and he had an oxygen sensor, so he could track his health every step of the way. We had found a consultant after returning from Nepal the first time. And as well as checking for long-term damage, and thankfully there was none, she also helped him devise a plan for this next challenge and prescribe some emergency rescue medications should it be needed. I didn't go. I was at home. I was heavily pregnant with our first son. But that doesn't mean that I wasn't there. Every day he sent me his readings from his oxygen sensor and his heart rate monitor. So every day I knew that he was safe and he was healthy and his ranges were in the normal value. So did his doctor, because he was also sending this information to her. And it worked. Not only did he stay safe and healthy, he completed his challenge. There was no need for the rescue medication and there was certainly no need for a rescue helicopter this time around. So it's about investing in yourself and taking responsibility for your health. Coming back to George Mallory and his answer to the question, why climb Everest? If you remember, he said, because it's there. You have a mountain of data at your fingertips. This data is about you, about your health and your body. So use this data. Use this data to learn about how your body functions, whether you're completely healthy or whether you're managing a chronic condition. Share this data. Share this data with your family. Share it with your doctors. It might change how they treat you or the medications that they prescribe you. And use this information. Use this data to have power over your health because it's just too important not to. Thank you.